Welcome to another episode of Pit Lane Parlay. Welcome to another episode of Pit Lane Parlay. I am your host, Mike Joko. Matt is here, and we have plenty to discuss Formula One, and we are going to talk a lot about testing, something I never thought I would say on a Pit Lane Parlay episode, but Matthew, how are you? Doing all right. Let me, let, let, let's just jump right in. Oh, no, let's not jump right into it. Let's first give a condolences to Murray Walker, legendary broadcaster, one of my favorite to listen to old, you know, when I watch old F1 races, I always love the Murray Walker era. So condolences to him and his family. I don't know if you have anything to add there or we can, we can jump right into everything. Yeah, I uh, I think anybody who watched Formula One back in the day grew up with Murray Walker. He had an iconic voice and always knew what to say. You know, never he enhanced every great Formula One moment from that generation, and he's sorely missed already. And just want to wish his family well because obviously he had a great impact on a lot of people. And for me personally, made watching Formula One back in the day just that much better. Yeah, very well said. Really sad to see on a on a long week last week. But we did have testing, three days of, of testing at Bahrain. Before I break down a lot of the, the testing topics, what did you think of testing at Bahrain versus Spain where it's been the last, I don't know, handful of years? But I need to find a new site. I know it's a COVID world. I thought it was weird that Bahrain was offering teams and drivers vaccines. I think that was I think that was weird. Yeah. I mean I would I don't blame them at all for taking them. I don't know. I haven't had my finger on the pulse to see if like Carlos Sainz and Perez have been getting flack for taking it or Alpha Tauri has been getting flack, but you know, you get offered and why not, why would you say no? Um so yeah, I it's it's just not a real good simulation of what conditions are going to be like throughout the season. You know, obviously Bahrain is very hot. We have maybe a couple races that get that close and not even like Abu Dhabi because it's at night. So, and Bahrain's at night, isn't it too? So I, yeah. I, I don't think it's the best place to hold a test. I don't think Spain's the best place to hold a test. I think maybe looking elsewhere in Europe, I think Imola might be nice or Portimao or somewhere else. Because, yeah, maybe that would make Spain a little bit better if they didn't test there for three days and everybody knew exactly what to do when they showed up there. But it's nice to see cars back on track, though. That was that was a positive. Yes, I agree. Definitely stayed up late to catch like the beginning of the first day just to hear the cars on track and watch a little bit. What do you think if they, instead of you know every four or five years, it seems like they rotate. What if you switched? every year and it can be a track that's on the calendar but just switch it every year i i feel like now that you know not only is so preseason testing was this past weekend and we are from the day of recording this tuesday the 16th we're 12 days from the the start of the season so data is pretty damn relevant 12 days from now so what do you think about that idea yeah, I think that works. And I also think another point to add is that obviously COVID has kind of put everything sure. in a loop a little bit. But I always thought that F1 testing had to be somewhere in Europe just to make teams' lives a little easier. And we kind of now have lost that argument by having this test in Bahrain. Now, to me, there's no reason why they wouldn't be able to go to Brazil, Indianapolis, let's say, in the future, wherever, Sochi. I don't know how much setup Sochi takes or if that's a genuine street circuit. If that's a street circuit, that's a bad one. But you know what I mean? Just like any permanent facility doesn't have to be in Europe anymore, I guess. Um, so, yeah, I think rotating it every year to just keep it fresh and keep teams on their toes or even go down to just, you know, a grade one facility that's not on the calendar like Ares or something just right. to just to spice it up and keep teams on their toes. And every year the teams get a fresh outlook on some data before the season starts, but it wouldn't be like Spain every year where you, you know what you're going to get, you know what to do, you know how to prepare the car to an extent, but uh, you know, with the minor changes each season, you still have test items. So yeah, that, I think it sounds pretty good. Or like IndyCar where they go to Sebring, but don't actually race there every year. Like you mentioned, I think is a good idea. So anyway, testing, 
obviously it's hard to gauge lap times because teams are running a lot of different programs, but kind of the consensus top five, so top half of the field right now would, in our opinion, be Red Bull, Mercedes, McLaren, Alpha Tauri, and Aston Martin. I guess you're know, pretty much pretty much in that order to to me. I don't know if you have anything you wanted to add on our preseason ranking after that. Yeah, it's uh it's just testing for for our fans yep. out there. I think they're going to be battling with Alpine this year. And then you got Haas, Alpha, Romeo, and Williams kind of at the end of the field again. So I I am very pleased with Red Bull and we'll touch on Mercedes here in a little bit. And then McLaren definitely shocking some people so far. So I am cautiously optimistic that we might see more than one team win every race this year. We might see it divvied up between two or three teams, but we'll we'll see what what shakes out after the real race in Bahrain when there's no sandbagging. Yeah, obviously it's just testing and you know, we'll kind of segue right into the first issue here in a second with Mercedes kind of having some issues with the gearbox and then Botas saying that the rear end of the car was unstable and Hamilton had a couple spins there there as well that looked like it was the rear end snapping out. But it, I, I think it showed what teams are likely to be good and what teams really have no chance. Even if the order isn't necessarily 100% predetermined, I think Red Bull have more hope than in years past, and we'll dive into that more. But yeah, so... Mercedes had a bunch of gearbox issues kind of right off the bat. They seemed to say, like, they seemed to pretty much admit, listen, we're, we're having issues with this kind of leading into testing. And then Botas said the rear end was unstable. Hamilton had at least two spins that I can remember. One in the last turn heading on to the front straight, I think on the second day of testing, where his rear end just completely snapped out of the car. So... What do you make of Mercedes' three days of testing? I think it's the most unprepared they've been in Total Wolf's era. And I think the alarm bells should be ringing. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say they're not going to be fast, but are they going to be Mercedes fast? Are they going to be five tenths ahead of the field, which is what they've kind of been accustomed to for the last couple of years? And I just don't think they're there yet. And I do think Red Bull is just a little bit faster right now and now you know if mercedes came out of this test or you know they had a general sense of feeling really good after the test and you know oh hey we got this one in the bag already they could already start to focus on 2022 which i know they are a little bit but i feel like the top three here red bull mercedes and mclaren are now going to get into kind of like a mini development war for the rest of the year. And how much is that going to take away from 2022? So I would be slightly concerned if I was Mercedes. It's not exactly like, again, they're going to be very fast still. It's just that they may have to work a little harder for some of these wins this season. Man, you really stole my 2022 point. I wanted sorry, to leave sorry. it there. It's fair. But yeah, I, I it's definitely a concern. And I think the biggest thing and i'll well since you mentioned mclaren i'll just segue right into that the new rear diffuser that they put on the car i don't really know how to describe it in easy podcast terms here but they were able to essentially extend the rear diffuser under the car which allowed to make up for a little bit of the lack of downforce that the cars have this year because of the smaller floors so do you think we're gonna see teams probably or most likely try to copy mclaren and are you surprised that nobody else thought of that someone at mclaren was surprised i don't know if it was their technical director he's like yeah i'm surprised nobody else did this it's like well <laughs> you just gave him a blueprint on how to do it which is i know how formula one works one team does it if it works other teams try to copy it so i think that's the thing is mclaren has to come out these first few races go hard and go fast because I don't know how long a, a diffuser takes to develop. I'm assuming it takes a month or two 
I don't think it's something you can just rush and do very quickly because you want to get it right. So you have Let's to safely say at least a month. Yeah, safely a month. So that means the first couple of races, McLaren really has to come out and try to make the most of it. And then while other teams are focused on the diffuser, McLaren, you know, hopefully has something else in the works for upgrades and development or whatever, just because they're in a good position. They're in the best position they've been in in a long time and they need to capitalize because right now I guarantee every team that is going to develop their car this year is already looking at the diffuser. And I don't know what the regulations say. I mean, it's perfectly legal, but every time a team does this, the FIA, you know, Oh no, did they exploit a loophole? Do we need to correct that for 2022? So we'll be curious to see if they have to amend the laws again. Cause it's a, I mean, diffuser is always important, but this is the first time in a while that, you know, T or we as fans and people inspecting the cars after a test to go, Oh, the diffuser, diffuser, diffuser. You know, Red Bull had a great diffuser way back in the day. Braun basically won a championship with the diffuser. Uh, but ever since then they've changed regulations and it's been a key part of the car, but they've all kind of been the same. So this is the first time in a while that, you know, we've scrutineered a diffuser to, to this degree. And yeah, I bet you a Red Bull, Mercedes, everybody, they're they're hard at work for a new one because you know it seemed to be working for McLaren quite well. Yeah. Before we move on, I don't think it's necessarily a loophole, but like we both said, kind of before the year started, we figured teams would find a way to get creative within the rules or or loopholes. The Motorsport.com article, which had a couple writers on it, I am losing my place. Here we go. There had been suspicions that McLaren found a clever solution to the new rules. So not necessarily a loophole if we're going based off of the pictures and what's written here by people who were at the test, but they definitely got creative and more power to them for kind of getting a leg up on everybody. Let's see here real quick before we talk about kind of winners and losers and then move on. We had the... Haas livery, the Williams livery, and the Ferrari livery reveal right before testing. And a little story time here. <laughs> there is something lacking from those three remaining cars that was promised to us on January 24th, 2021. It might have been January 10th. I forget the exact date. but There is no Rich Energy logo on there. And uh, a source told me that the quote unquote deal came together too late and they are looking towards 2022 again. Remember who we're talking about and we can revisit this again in a year because it's probably nothing as Matt saw. I have a lot of information that we're just waiting to come out on, on them. So stay tuned for that. I don't know where you want to start, which one you like the most or least out of the remaining three, but I'll let you I'll let you pick which one you want to start with here. Williams is fantastic. That's their best yeah, I think livery. It's really cool. Best livery in a while. For those who saw my video that was up for nine minutes, I commented about as as such before the FIA slapped me in the face. Yeah, I absolutely love the Williams car. I think it's great. I wish it was faster, but it's definitely gonna look good at the back of the field. Haas, I don't understand the Russian flags. I don't understand why the only American team has three Russian flags on it. So that sucks. And then Ferrari is the most tragic car in the field by far. The burgundy rear wing was the first thing I hated. Or, you know, kind of the back engine cover. And then the rear wing are burgundy and the rest of the car is Ferrari red. But then there's also the lime green mission window logo right front and center. Oh man, that's a good thing they're not going to be fast this year because that's not a car that people are going to want to remember. That's all I got. That's it's terrible. Okay, I'm going to start with Ferrari. I appreciated the attempt to blend the red at the front to the red at the back, like their anniversary livery last year. Although it was a poor effort and didn't end up looking very well, so I agree with your point there. Yeah, the lime green is awful. The lime green and red combination is terrible. And when you saw their their driver introduction a couple of weeks ago, 
And you saw the little bit of white, red, and green kind of striped down the the fire suit. I thought, okay, the, yeah, that that could be pretty cool on a car. And instead, they went with lime green. I just, I, I have no words. Haas, the only American team, leads me to believe that pretty soon they are going to be owned by Haas driver number two's dad. With all this Russian flag and Russian sponsors. When when you have an F1 livery and the World Anti-Doping Agency is looking into the use of your livery because of the sanctions against Russia, you really screwed up. And Williams, I I said before when we were talking about liveries, like if we should see minor changes every year or big changes every year, and I said minor changes. Well, Williams went with a big change after their kind of boring run of liveries for many years, and it's really cool. Definitely, definitely like that. So with that being said, winners and losers of the test. If you're going to pick two winners and two losers, could be team, could be driver, could be fans, could be the FIA, could be Rich Energy. Whichever direction you want to take it, you are free to take it. Why don't you go first? I've been going first all night. Oh, okay. Wow, that's so nice of you. Let's see here. I'm going to go with losers. (laughs) Rich Energy. They are the only loser. That's not no. true. In all, yeah. In all seriousness, uh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna put Haas as a loser, only because they not only have already given up on the year prior to preseason testing, they didn't show any pace in testing. I don't even know if they were using a new engine. I thought I heard they were using a 2020 Ferrari engine in there or something like that. I could be missing that, but. The upgraded uh, front wing and and front downforce they tried throughout the weekend helped a little bit, but both the drivers still looked like they had a hell of a time managing that car. And my other loser is going to be Aston Martin because they just didn't get a ton of testing in with some turbo issue, and then I think they also had a gearbox issue. So I'm going to take that. I'm going to leave the other obvious ones for you. Winners, or, or do you want to go? Do you want to do losers, and then we'll switch to winners? Sure. I guess my big loser is Mercedes. I think um, again they're going to be fast, but I just think not their usual German selves to not show up super prepared and you know have all their eyes dotted and T's crossed just with gearbox issues and this issue and that issue and you know something with the rear of the car is not quite right yet. So it's definitely time to start putting their nose back into the the regulations and seeing what they can exploit because they're unfortunately not at the level that they expect for themselves, which is something total we'll touch on last year, where it's, it's a lot of pressure to be the best team because you have to kind of continually show up every weekend and be the best. And especially with the new season starting, everybody's kind of back on a even playing field to an extent you know, you never know which team's going to pull some out of the bag. And now, you know, they may not be Kings of the Hill heading into the first round. So we'll see what happens. Winners. Let's go. Hmm. Let's go with Alpha Towery. I think they showed a lot more pace than we were expecting. I know rookie Yuki Sonoda was super fast. Although if you read enough and look at the data, he opened the DRS on his wing like super early, pretty much every lap he ran. So he got some some extra straightaway speed there down the front straight that he wouldn't typically have in qualifying or a uh, you know at the actual race itself. But nonetheless, really impressive that they were essentially in the top ten all six sessions throughout the three days and didn't really make too many mistakes and I'll take the obvious one here in McLaren for getting ahead and finding a creative way around the, the new rules to, to be incredibly impressive throughout testing. And I'm going to go with Red Bull and I think they're looking as good as they have in a very long time. Ever since, you know, 2014 was very rough for them. 2015 was average. 2016 was about as good as they could have wished since that was one of the Mercedes' best years. And then ever since then, it's kind of been scrapping for a win or two every season. Uh, I think they are looking good this year. I have some high hopes now for Red Bull, and I 
I think that they can definitely contend for maybe a handful of wins, depending on how quick Mercedes can either figure out their issues or develop the car. But um, they hardly put a wheel wrong this weekend, and I think uh, all looks to be good. So question for you. Do we think uh, Matteo Bonotto is going to come out every week and say that Ferrari is not going to be fast this year? God, I hope not. I really am beginning to despise every time I see his name attached to an article because he just says something where you're like, why, what, like what blackmail does he have on Ferrari owners or who has black, you know, he's got blackmail on somebody. The fact that he can just come out and be like, yeah, you know, whatever 2021's done. Like this isn't Haas where we're expecting them to be like a laughing stock. This is Ferrari that's been around, you know, they're the longest, oldest F1 team and they are just a step above laughing stock. Yeah. I, I mean, it's almost like who keeps asking him these questions? You know, does, do they not read the prior statements or whatever? It's not like he, it's not like it's a surprise at this point that Ferrari is not going to be Ferrari this year. Uh, but the fact that he, but also, sorry, go ahead. Well, the fact that he keeps having to answer these questions and just like, yeah, we're not going to be quick this year. It's just like, uh huh. You said that last week. And if you didn't know to, if you didn't notice, he said that three weeks ago too. And before that, it was like two months ago. And before that, it was blank check. I'm gonna need three years to get this right. So, poor guy. I don't know why he keeps having to answer this question. On the same token, Mattia, if you keep getting asked the same question, just stop answering it. You might actually make yourself look better if you just stop answering it. I'm just here just so I say, won't be fined. Yeah, just. <laughs> Yeah, just say anything but what you've already said. Just say nothing. You might actually, people might start to, you know, the media will have less to make fun of you on and might start to look better then when things start to improve instead of, it's going to take three years. It's going to take three years. But I also, your your point is not wrong either. Ferrari have admitted though that there's, and that's something that we've already kind of touched on, that they're, after the test, they are confident their straight line speed issues have been worked out based on the power unit so that's good uh there's gonna be no fans at baku this year which is not the biggest surprise given that it is a street race but i am super stoked that it's looking good to stay on the schedule because that's one of the best races of the year reno is open to adding a partner team for alpine similarly to kind of like an alfa romeo to ferrari type situation but uh it's not it's not going to be for a while 2023 at the earliest so it's not going to be next season i don't know if they're gonna you know like form a partnership with an existing team which at this point their options are haas maybe alfa romeo depending on how that partnership well fiat owns alfa romeo don't they yeah but isn't alfa romeo more just name only that's true i guess it's technically still sauber technically so i guess if they somehow bought the rights to that yeah okay i see what you're saying yeah or you know if there are rumors of new teams coming uh, i will i've never put this in the rundown one i wanted to get your opinion on the name that keeps popping up for a new new constructor uh eventually i don't know if it's 2022 or beyond is volkswagen and let me while i talk here and kind of cue you up for this one more topic I want to touch on before we get to Volkswagen is that uh, we've talked a lot about Grosjean's accident from Bahrain. Obviously, there was a bunch of details that came out from the FIA about the crash, and there was some sort of malfunction with the fuel tank that did allow the full tank, because it was the first lap of the race, the full tank of fuel to be split open and thus igniting. Uh, but hopefully, based on the details and findings of that accident, that they can look to see if there's anything that needs to be corrected. It was kind of just an awkward cr- crash all around. So I don't know if we just want to chalk that up to sometimes that kind of stuff's going to happen. Um, but yes, Volkswagen, uh, while I do some Googling here, what are your overall thoughts about their prospects in the formula one? And there's a lot of ways you can take that because obviously Volkswagen is the you know, Volkswagen group is like 17 different car brands, but I know they they wanted to get out of all, you know, they wanted to be electric only in motorsports or electric only in general within X number of years. So I, 
I don't know what to think of it. It's it kind of caught me off guard, and I didn't read the article, but I know I, I saw the headline. So maybe I'm just kind of reading too much into what they had previously said. But unless F1 is going more hybrid in their engine or something like that, I don't know if it would necessarily be a great fit for Volkswagen. But the name alone is is huge, so it would be a great sponsor to or a great manufacturer to get if if it happens yes i i think they're a huge company and as long as we do enough scrutineering on making sure they're not cheating the system on their either a fuel emissions or b how much fuel they have in the car which is my awful dad joke for the episode i think that we should be good to go on letting them in the sport (laughs) um it's okay mike i'm your co-host it's fine (laughs) All right, second question. So obviously, it's kind of like one of those situations where you know you have Fiat, and I'm looking at a list here. Fiat owns Alfa Romeo, Chrysler, Dodge, Fiat, Jeep, Maserati, Lancia, Ferrari. You know, so they have all these labels that they can run under, but obviously Fiat's not in the championship. Volkswagen owns Audi, Bentley, Bugatti, Lamborghini, Porsche, Skoda, and then obviously Volkswagen. Of those brands, because I've seen a couple concepts out there on the internet, which brand do you think they should enter the sport with? That's a great question. Can you can you read me that list one more time? Yeah, they got Audi, Bentley, Bugatti, Lambo, Porsche, Skoda, Volkswagen, and there's another one, Seat, all caps. Never heard of them. Yeah, there's a few in in there that I I haven't heard of, but if I'm gonna pick one, which is really hard to do. I'm going to say Audi. Audi has some of the best looking sports cars, you know, road road legal sports cars that is that that I'm a big fan of. So I think that would be pretty cool. They are 100% owner of Audi for at least a while now. So I don't know. I think that would be pretty cool. Some some German rivalry going on there with Mercedes I think would be kind of interesting. Yeah, I think um I like the idea of them going with Lamborghini or Porsche. Porsche would be like super official, super whatever. Like we're gonna hear, we're gonna come here and do some maths and win the championship. Versus like Lamborghini, it's like our car is gonna be bright yellow. <laughs> so I think uh, Lamborghini would be a funner choice in my opinion, just because that Lamborghini brand is so cool. Audi would be okay. I I don't like Audi drivers as far as like road drivers. I think they're like some of the worst people on the road. Uh, so I think the Audi brand as a whole you know, annoys me. Yeah, and then I I mean to kind of circle back, I just think going with like Volkswagen I think would be boring. That'd be like the most boring option Great. of all the just like oh hey, let's all cheer for the Volkswagen team. It's like no, wouldn't you rather cheer for like Lamborghini or Audi or Porsche? Like that'd be so much funner. Because the only thing I think of when I think of Volkswagen is the Beetle, and I don't want to think of that as, as like race car. No, um, there is a Volkswagen Beetle in Gran Turismo. Speaking of race cars, and it's un, it's strangely a good car to race with. I don't personally use it in the game, but it is always very competitive. That's weird. I will just leave that racing I think, gaming uh, tidbit at that. If I'm not mistaken, I think my Lamborghini did engines in the 80s and early 90s, and then. Porsche ran under the tag label before. So tag was really big with McLaren before McLaren switched to Honda and like the Senna era. Uh, But they want to McLaren won a couple championships with tag behind them. So yeah, I think that is definitely, I mean, obviously we love the pioneer teams to come in kind of the mercenary teams, like, you know, racing point or uh, Haas, but uh, it's always good when you can add a constructor and, you know, with Aston Martin this year, hopefully becoming a works team eventually. Red Bull is becoming a works team, and if Volkswagen joins, it's definitely a good sign for the sport going forward. Totally, totally agree. So I think that wraps everything up. So I hope you guys enjoyed testing. We'll be back next week. Two F1 episodes next week. Obviously, the season preview being that next week leads up to the opening race. We will have that plus a special episode hope you enjoyed listening to me get absolutely trounced in trivia last week i can't promise trivia my trivia game will ever improve but last week was especially embarrassing and i i don't know i put on a rich energy level of 
skill and my trivia knowledge there. Anyway, we'll wrap it up there, guys. Have a good weekend and get ready for the season. Today's podcast is presented by Podgo. Podgo is the easiest way for you to monetize your podcast, providing podcasters with a flat rate for ad space so you always know how much you get when you include an ad from Podgo. I recently joined as a member, and you can too. Apply today to become a member and immediately be connected with advertisers that fit your audience. That's podgo.co at p-o-d-g-o dot c-o.